Well, good evening from Emerald Hill Skies. My name is Doug Lucas, and it's great to have you here tonight. We're streaming from the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky, where we have a PureTech 2 observatory with a Rasa 11, a Roe Ackerman Schmidt astrograph made by Celestron. It's 11 inches aperture. And uh, at the business end of that scope, we have an ASI 2600MC Pro. Uh, on top of the scope, we have a little uh, ASI 178 monochrome camera, not, uh, not attached to a scope. That gives us about a 150 degree uh, view of the sky, which lets us kind of stay connected with the stars, which we really like. But we're actually broadcasting from inside of a building about uh, 200 feet away from the Roloff Roof Observatory. You can see that adjustable height pier that the telescope was mounted on. It's got an Ioptron CEM70G mount on top of that adjustable height pier. And we're about 200 feet away, and actually the data <clears throat> are carried via uh, fiber optics from this little rig rack at the base of that pier. Uh, there's a little box there that converts the data to fiber optic signals and I've got a box here on my desk that converts it back and we're able to feed it into SharpCap to uh, try to give you images from this scope that's out there, um, as you can see, in a very inky black dark night. And we're happy that we're ahead of the, sun, ahead of the moon rise. So there's absolutely no moon. It's uh, completely black. And what a contrast from the other night when <clears throat> we could see this observatory completely illuminated by moonlight. 100% moonlight. And it's not that the moon uh, disappeared that quickly, <laughs> it's that it just hasn't risen yet and won't be up tonight from 9 to 11 Eastern Time. So we'll be able to have these inky black skies. You can see the weights that are west and the scope is <clears throat> east and it's about to give us an upside down view of the, of the object we're going to look at. But let me just see who's on board here. Ken, welcome to you. You showed up early. I guess the Super Bowl wasn't very interesting to you. <laughs> Ray, if I remember right, you live close to the, where the game's being played, so you could probably take some binoculars and watch the high kickoffs. You could see the football up in the air, I bet. <clears throat> Looks like you've got some strong winds there. Uh, let's see. You guys have been having a regular conversation there about the Super Bowl <laughs> traffic moving in and out. <clears throat> Uh, we are not real big in numbers yet, I guess perhaps because of the Super Bowl or maybe because it's Valentine's Day Sunday. <clears throat> you know, we thought that per perhaps since it was Valentine's Day coming up, what is it, day after tomorrow, right? <clears throat> that we would try to think of at least starting off with a Valentine's Day object. <clears throat> and what better object to start off with than something that is red, but also talks about an old flame, and this is the Flame Nebula. <clears throat> so we've been gathering uh, images on this for about six minutes, not enough to get rid of all the grain yet, but certainly enough to get rid of some of it. <clears throat> and this is just a beautiful sight, isn't it? It's, uh, it's a hydrogen alpha cloud, and here in front of us is the Flame Nebula. You can see these flames, it looks like a flame <clears throat> Otherwise, sometimes I think it looks like a tree. If you think about the trunk being here and then the branches up here. <clears throat> of course, this is uh, that famous star that causes everybody to be washed out. What's it called? Is it Miratak or something like that? I forget the name of it. And this is uh, the horse head in this horse head nebula that's right here. So you really get two objects for one here. It's a two for one special, huh? There are some open clusters here that are basically lighting up these hydrogen alpha clouds. <clears throat> and isn't this an object that I think comes into play later? Uh, let's read a little bit about this. This is uh, this is NGC 2024. It's a large, reasonably bright, yet elusive, diffuse nebula in Orion. It literally kisses second magnitude Zeta Orionis, the easternmost star in Orion's belt. So if you've seen those three stars in the belt of Orion, this is the easternmost star. <clears throat> Appropriately, because of its photographic image, 
<clears throat> which shows the bright nebula sliced in two by a dark lane. It is called, among other things, the Lips Nebula. And don't you think uh, that would be good for uh, Valentine's Day, too? If you can block Zeta Orionis with a building or some distant structure, NGC 2044 can be seen in binoculars from a dark sky. The glow is large, so that it's best seen in low powers in a telescope. He tells you how to find it. And then he says uh, the, the core is quite bright and its dark lane is dim but apparent. Although the nebula shines at seventh magnitude, you have to imagine the light spread out over an area the size of the full moon. The brightest segments of the cloud lie on either side of the north-south oriented dark lane. So that dark lane, would that be like uh, dust and soot and carbon? Or would it be a little bit of a dark nebula? Um, <clears throat> this star, let's uh, quickly go look up the name of this star. Um, Mir Fock, I forget what it's called. Let's see, show chart. Mir Tak Al Alni Tak Alni Tak. That's what it is. Alni Tak. So here's the Flame Nebula. This is sometimes called the Lump Star, but this nebula is. Isn't there a name for that nebula? I guess that's just the nebulosity around the Lump Star. And. That's another nebula out to the edge. I wonder if we can see that. Maybe here, a little nebulosity around that star, which is called IC435, that nebulosity. And of course, this entire thing is called the Horsehead Nebula. So if you can picture this, here's the belt of Orion. Now, whenever you go out and you look up, if you can think about the star on Orion's right, remember he's got his bow and he's got his, what is this, a slingshot or a big club, depending on your, your picturing him. Um, now you can always remember that Alnitak is right here and the flame nebula is right here and you saw it live. Let's see. Um, as someone said once, all the usual suspects. Good to have you guys back. I was thinking that I, how good of friends we've become and we've never actually met in person. We speak over this uh, crazy uh, live stream. There's Stu back. Stu, you've got a, a cyclone breeding, stirring up where you are. Are you okay? Are you safe? There's Wes from Australia. I think that cyclone is gonna affect you as, affect you as well, Wes. David from New Brunswick. You don't have a cyclone up there. Um, let's see, uh, Andy, good evening, Andy says, uh, Andy, where are you coming from? I forget <clears throat> where you are. Well, anyway, this is what we're seeing here. This is a beautiful site. This is at full frame, APS-C frame. So this is large. I mean, the frame of the, of the APS-C image sensor of this camera is two degrees wide which means this Horsehead Nebula takes up about a full degree, you know, so it, it is incredible. And this Flame Nebula, something akin to that. So quite a beautiful sight. We're gonna stop at 12 minutes here and, and um, zoom on because we're gonna try to tackle a lot of objects tonight if we can. But it's a great uh, Valentine's Day Nebula to start with, isn't it? Next, let's go to, oh, I forgot to do an observation here. Let's uh, write something about this. Um, uh, incredible view of the Lips Nebula. <laughs> I've never heard it called that. New to me. Or the flame, your old flame uh, beside bright Alnitak. 
beautiful image. Okay, our next image, let's go to the Cosmic Bat. It's NGC 1788. NGC 1788. The Cosmic Bat. The Cosmic Bat Nebula. What a um, what a name, right? Cosmic Bat, Arkansas. Clear skies, about forty-three degrees. We have. Uh, let's see how. Where is the temperature? There it is, thirty-nine point two. So about the same. Stu is nine hours away from the eye of the cyclone. It's heading right at me. Oh my goodness, Stu. I'm so sorry. Lord, please take care of Stu. Andy's been outside looking for balloons. <laughs> looking for balloons. Andy. That's awesome. Well, you can never tell, can you? Anymore, you can never tell. <clears throat> okay, so we're on, uh, we're on 1788. Is that right? 1788? Yes, 1788. Why isn't that in my list of NGC objects? How did that escape me? I'm going to have to look it up in the index. 1788, page 30. Uh, it's a small but surprisingly bright reflection nebula next to a tenth magnitude star at small telescopes that appear as more extensive at lower power than at high power. Well, there it is, right in the middle. Uh, it's a small two arc minute wide bright glow with sideways V-shaped concentration. The V's arms point east and southeast. Dark matter causes the variation in the cloud's brightness. So we're gonna do a display histogram stretch. And then that grainy red, one has to wonder what causes that. Let's get rid of that. Why does our automatic color balance think that's appropriate? I think that's most of it. We'll zoom in on it here. Okay, and it's still uh, still forming up there. Small but two arc minute wide bright glow, thin and diffuse halo of material surrounds the bright core. At magnification 72 enhances the central condensation but dims the surrounding diffuse material. Several nebulous knots or dim stars are superimposed on the cloud. I wonder if our flats are serving us well here. I wonder if that's the flat that's making all that, all that confetti in there. Of course, it's just two minutes of, two minutes of uh, integration so far. Do you think it's still too much red? because there sure is a lot of confetti in the sky, huh? This is just a faint just a faint nebulosity The Cosmic Bat. Now, why would this be called the Cosmic Bat, pray tell? What, why would you think this looks like a bat? I don't 
good. And it's basically just a bunch of lit up dust, isn't it? Backlit dust. These two stars are traveling through a gas cloud, huh? Yeah, Stu is reminding us, please uh, do subscribe if you would be so kind. It helps get the channel up in people's uh, views when they search. And also click like, Stu is asking. Thank you, Stu. Oh, you're very kind, Andy. Stu is like, Stu is, you're like the, uh, the moderator. <laughs> you know, uh, while we're waiting for this to form up for just a minute, this cosmic bat, um, if you are interested, some people have asked, let me, you might shade your eyes for a minute because I'm going to click to something a little bit more, a little bit brighter. Ouch. We have this, uh, we have this store from, Spur, what's it called, Spread Shop? Let's go here and see. Uh, if you go to the channel, Emerald Hill Skies on YouTube, then you'll see uh, a thing called Store. And it'll show you a bunch of sample things like stickers and tote bags and t-shirts and mugs. But if you go to any of those click spread shops and then look for all, you know, you can get hoodies galore, different colors. You can pick your, pick your color. You can go with green if you want. Now there's a nice look for your, to prepare for your March, you know, St. Patrick's Day with the Emerald Hill Skies logo there. And keep watching the spread shop because we'll keep adding additional merchandise. So that's, and all of the funds from Super Chats and also this merchandise, I don't take any of that. It all goes to um, this month, this, these uh, observations. It's going to uh, the, the earthquake survivors, earthquake victims over in Turkey and Syria. And we'll get over there right away. I mean, lickety split. I mean, if you give tonight, then literally you'll be helping refugees in 24 hours. Uh, looks like we've had a little bit of movement, which is odd, isn't it? Um, but we're still trying to see more of this nebulosity. Let's see if we can bring some more in. So strange. I wonder if this is my, I'm going to try this next object without flats and see what happens. Because I just have to wonder if maybe the flats are not helping us. So anyway, there you have the cosmic bat. It's basically just a cloud of dust around uh, these two stars. Cosmic bat. Mike, good to have you aboard. Which feature did you change from Astro Planner to Deep Sky Planner? I'm trying to decide also for EAA. Very much like your style. You're so kind. Droy, D-R-O-I, P-B. Uh, I like um, I like Deep Sky Planner. It's just a more attractive interface. And for me, uh, as there was nothing wrong with Astro Planner. It's just that the interface seemed a little too filled with lots of different squares and things that were all jumbled up. So I kind of like this better. I'm going to say a cloud of dust around these two stars form the cosmic bat. Frankly, we couldn't see a lot of the bat uh, metaphor. <laughs> but we could see the clouds around the stars, to be fair. Um, I kind of just think that uh, Deep Sky Planner is a more attractive interface, and I just like, I'm going to stop live stacking for a second. I'm just going to switch, and I think I'm just going to try taking off flats altogether. Let's just say 
none for a minute and see what happens. Let's just see what happens, okay? Now let's start up our sequencer. Um, I tell you what, the authors of the authors of Deep Sky Planner are very present with you. They um, they correspond with you. This is NGC ten fifty five coming up. They'll correspond with you at the drop of a hat, and I kind of like that. Uh, it was hard for me sometimes to understand the um, the paradigm of Astro Planner because of the way the the whatever you call the documents or something work. Whereas with Deep Sky Planner, for some reason, I kind of get the paradigm more. I don't know why. Um, but I think now more than anything else. I just like the interface. Um, it's just dark and beautiful and red, and it gives you about five or six themes to choose from. I can't make Astro Planner look this pretty. It works well with my telescope, and uh, Astro Planner sometimes would drop the scope. I don't know why. Whereas Deep Sky Planner seems to really lock in with the scope and that way you can do these slews with no problem. It has a nice interface with your um, planetarium software. For instance, if we want to see where NGC 1055 is, I just click here and uh, let's back off of this some. And then I go right click on the object and say show chart and bam, it instantly cues up the location of the object. And I couldn't really say that I understood how to do that as well in um, Astro Planner. I bet, it, I bet it did, I just couldn't make it do it as well. You can see we're looking over the south-southwest uh, edge of our horizon. And that's a photorealistic view of our horizon. A little, little shelter there we call a prayer shelter. It's like a little gazebo. Uh, we have 29 of those on Emerald Hills campus, and that's just one of them. But over the tops of those trees, and then I have the photo lowered a little bit, and then this line is supposed to be the exact horizon, but you know it's not exact. But it gives us a good, you know, a good approximation. You can see that Cetus is here above, and again this is NGC 1055. So I'll go in the title and I'll change this 1055, and this is. A galaxy and Cetus. So for orientation, um, I guess you would have this be the south pole, the south azimuth pole, and that's the meridian. And you can see that's the zenith. So we're up about 39 degrees from the horizon. And this band is supposed to give us a good, clear picture of the exact horizon. So you see, I do have the photo lowered a bit so that we can see the line and the trees. And that way we can also see when something's about to rise. Like I can read that this is Pisces. And uh, that lets us see a little bit sort of under the horizon. And yet we know that this line, you can see how it sort of more or less matches the photo of the trees. Um, there's Andromeda, and so you can see we're kind of in between west and south here. Let's go and look at the uh, actual object. Um, this is a galaxy, NGC 1055. NGC 1055 and our reds are still over 
active a little bit. Well, I don't know if that uh, did any good to drop that flat or not. There's still some grain in there, but this is just three minutes, I know that, but still some grain, but you can still see this galaxy here. It's, uh, again, it's NGC 1055. Look at that swirly grain. I wonder, is that my dark? I'm using the same dark, but then again, maybe on nights that are moonlit, that's not showing up. Next time we'll drop the dark as well and see if the dark is messing us up. Okay, so NGC 1055 is on page 316. Can you guys believe that I worked ahead tonight and wrote down all these page numbers to make things faster? It's a moderately large but dim, nearly edge-on galaxy, about 35 minutes east and slightly north of fourth magnitude Delta Ceti. Small telescope users should be prepared to use averted vis vision and low power to see its dim form. Its major axis is infiltrated with light obscuring dust, which makes it a challenge to see. I wonder if it doesn't help much, does it? It almost helps more to let the reds drop And then let's bring the mids up. Wow. Isn't that something, the way it has that sharp dust lane? It's an elongated haze immediately southeast, roughly 12th magnitude star. The galaxy is elongated west, northeast to east, southeast, and it swells with a vertivision. Seen together with M77, this appears much larger, though much dimmer. It's more difficult to see as just the central lens is readily visible. So that would be that, that core. That's what he's calling the central lens. It looks like a contact lens shape, doesn't it? But look how this dust lane is kind of obscuring this portion of it. Isn't that interesting? It kind of cuts it in half. NGC 1055. Let's go out and look real quick. NGC 1055. Ah, yeah, look. We're seeing that dust lane, aren't we? Isn't that amazing the way it... Oh, it's downloading this image. Um, let's see. Than that. Wow, yeah. So we're seeing this black dust lane here, but not with those star forming clouds. We're just seeing that black. Isn't it interesting how a little 11 inch telescope could pick up that sharp dust lane? And then look how we could see how it was separating the glow from the other side. So you almost had two sets of glows here. Now let's go back to the real-time image. See, there's that black dust lane separating that haze, the glow from the other side. Very interesting, isn't it? There you can see it a little better now. I've got this digitally turned up, you know, zoomed in, but there's that dust lane. Let's see what you guys are saying about this. So Andy, you did think it looked like a bat. Mike's telescope, good to have you here, Mike. Um, Aladdin, to take a look at what things might look like. Aladdin is flanked by the dark nebula known as Lin 1616. Let me get this down. And that's lens of the Y. Stu gave us a name for that dark stripe that separated the galaxy into two distinct 
halves, it was Lens 1616, which is apparently part of NGC. How can it be part of 1788? Um, 52 million light years away. I see NGC 1087, 1090, 1094 appear close, but they simply appear in the field of view in our background galaxies. Ken says it's like a bird of prey. As we don't be afraid to crank the gain up. Can see M77 in that frame too, Stu says. No, no, that was the last one. Oh, I see. So, Lens 1616 was the last one. Oh, bummer. So I'm going to say this galaxy has a dust lane down the middle that cuts it in two. Very interesting. See the Hubble view, if that was the Hubble view. ESO, E-S-O. Um, doesn't say here who captured this, does it? ESO's very large telescope array. Huh. Well, it's a good view of it anyway. Uh, after we save this, I'm going to stop the live stack. And now let's drop the darks. Let's go back to basics here and see if the darks are what's giving me the strange confetti. Let's say hot pixel removal only. And now go to our sequencer and go to our next object, which is 1084. NGC 1084, it's in Eridanus. Not very much movement there, was there? Pretty close by. Boy, this is a beautiful night sky now. Oh yeah, I can see it kind of floating there in the middle. Right there, see, I can see a little waft of something. Um, right here in the middle. This is uh, NGC 1084. Aren't we thankful to uh, William Herschel, who found all these objects? William Herschel uh, he was observing from, I think, most of the time, parts of England, like Bath and everything. He started in Hanover, but I think he went to Bath, 1781, discovered Uranus. Huh. Busy guy. Somebody tell me, how many galaxies did he discover? Something like, I mean, it's an astronomical number, no pun intended. I think it was like, 2,500? I don't know if you can see. Maybe I'll put for just a second here. There's William. Of course, Caroline was uh, a great helper for him. Here's a picture of the telescope he used. A homemade, I think, 18-inch telescope. And so we're on the Herschel list. We've got about, I don't know, 100 objects left, 109, something like that. After tonight, hopefully, we'll be down to 100. And we're currently on 1084. 1084, which is on page 319. So we'll just do another display histogram stretch. And then major histogram stretch. C 
See, I don't think our darks were helping us much. I, I think I think I have a problem with that particular set of darks, I think. I think it was a little bit problematic, actually. Of course, it is a nice black sky now. Boy, that's a beautiful little... Even if it's a little, it's a beautiful little galaxy that's coming up there. It is small though, isn't it? Let's err on the side of a little more mass to that galaxy. And then we've only got 100 seed, 120 seconds. And we're already beginning to make out some spiral structure there. It's amazing. Electronically assisted astronomy is amazing. His sister found most of them, and it was Slough. S-L-O-U-G-H, England. Slow, Slough. So, this is uh, 1055. NGC. Sorry, 1084, 1084. Let me change our major title on here. 1084, a galaxy in Eridanus. Um, 1084, the small but fairly bright galaxy, and he tells where to find it. It's highly condensed, an oval glow about two arc minutes wide, oriented northeast to southwest. Averted vision shows the core to be slightly brighter and elongated. This would be fun in a telescope with a, a longer focal length with a little bit longer time. You know how that works if you have, if you have a closer up view of this. In other words, a longer focal length, then it's going to take a longer time to image it. So one of the advantages of a RASA, it's got like a two degree wide field of view. Doesn't zoom in very closely on these small objects, does it? But it's f2, focal ratio 2, whereas scopes that are like long focal length are typically maybe focal ratio 10. And every time you go up an f-stop, like from 2 to 2.8, 2.8 to 3.5, 3.5 to 5.6, 5.6 to 8, and then 8 up to 11, every time you go up, it's exponentially longer. So it's taking us four minutes to see this object, and it might take 30 minutes to see the same thing as we're going to see here in six minutes. So there is an advantage to these low f-stop scopes. And yet, they do make us zoom in with our, with our optical, with our digital zoom sometimes, don't they? But look, we can, with the EAA, Electronically Assisted Astronomy, we can bump up the mids a little bit. And that lets us see a little bit more of that structure. It almost looks like there's a trailing arm sprawling out some, some material here, doesn't it? And then there's definitely material being strewn out here. It looks like this galaxy has interacted with something. 1084. Let's get back to our observation. Where did our observation, there it is. So we're gonna say, this galaxy looks like it has interacted with something. The arms seem a bit too misaligned or something, or whatever you want to call them. Torn up. Nice spiral structure visible after just five minutes. See what you guys are saying here. 1084 has been the site of five 
supernovae explosions over a period of 49 years. Wow, five supernovae in 49 years. That is active, isn't it? It's low in the sky, 1084 is 22 degrees here. Yeah, it's 33 here. Maybe a little higher there, but you could be picking up a little light pollution causing the image degradation. Uh, you know, it always hurts this year. We have a big light dome in Louisville here. Yeah, 9.25 edge, that's great for close-ups. Star formation is taking place in small bursts in the last 40 million years. The cause of the activity has been proposed as a merger with a gas-rich dwarf galaxy. There you go. Must have merged with a gas-rich dwarf galaxy. How about that? And we could pick that up, see? With a mere 11-inch scope, we could pick up that something has happened. Let's go out real quick, quick and look at 1084. Uh, NGC 1084 and see if we can find someone's astrophotography of this over several hours. <whistles> That's almost too close, but it is beautiful. Look at all the blue stars. All those are young, young stars, star forming regions. But look, sure enough, it has those wide spaced arms and this is from uh, Hubble and it's too close. Wow. Sure is beautiful though, isn't it? Every one of these little blue regions would be places where stars are being born. That's a beautiful little star there, amber. That's awesome. So we could see those arms torn up. I have been frequently described. Flatwater 5, it's good to have you back. You're a wild man. <laughs> All right, next. And the next object is, uh, oh, we gotta finish this. Is, uh, let's go ahead and do a run here to refresh the screen. 3294, I guess. Thirty-two ninety-four NGC thirty-two ninety-four. All of these have uh, numbers that Herschel used to catalog them, but honestly, Herschel's numbers are not as much fun. They're like letters and numbers and very complicated. I, I find it to be a little bit weird to refer to them. But, uh, you know, they are available if people want to see them. He was trying to catalog them, and to, to be honest, uh, with his 18-inch homemade telescope, he kind of miscatalogued some of them <laughs> in what we know today. But there's, I mean, no disrespect. He, he was certainly doing a great job. Um, Bundle Keeper, good to have you aboard. Have you heard anything about the impact expected over France tonight? No? Tell us about that bundle keeper. We haven't heard about that. Good to have you aboard from Dallas, Flatwater. So I honestly think we're doing better without flats and darks, just because I must not have those. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe I ought to have shot them tonight before I started so they can be accustomed to how inky black the scars, the stars are, how inky black the sky is. So we're 3294, 3294, and this is a galaxy in L minor. L minor, what's L? 3294, 117. 
what is L? One seventeen. Thirty-two ninety-four. Leo, Leo minor, of course. My apologies, Leo. Okay, I think this is maybe um, thirty-two ninety-four. We're going to visit several galaxies in Leo. There it is right there in the middle. Wow. That's amazing. Just up there the whole time for us to be able to see. A one meter asteroid, SAR 2667, will impact Earth's atmosphere over northern France between 3.50 a.m. and 4.03 Central European time on February 13th. That's indeed tonight, according to the European Space Agency. Yes, flats and darks should match the temps. Who knows what temperature I took those at. Right, right now it's 35 degrees. A meter wide meteor. Meter wide meteor. Wow. About, it was expected to hit about 40 minutes ago. Leo, thanks, dude. Darks, just make sure the chip temp is the same. Perfectly dark. No light leaks. Right. So, Mike, I'm using right now uh, sharp caps. Hot pixel removal only. You use a tracing board wrapped with white paper. Hang it on the tube and shoot from mid histogram. I have a, a special backlit white, you know, panel that works really well. And I just put the scope vertically and then put the panel on top of the scope. It works really well, but I must admit I did not take them tonight. It's some time ago that I took them. So that could be why I was getting some extraneous weird shapes there. Well, I'm going to go past the optical zoom and let's read about this. Did we already? 3294. 3294. Small but very dim galaxy. Uh, it would be very difficult to see in a small telescope with any light pollution at all. Best seen with moderate magnifications. You have to know exactly where to look. And, uh, and use averted vision to see it. Uh, under very dark skies, it's dim and small round glow that's barely brighter than the background sky. The galaxy is a bit more defined and a 72 power. It's two arc minute wide. It looks like a two arc minute wide comet with diffuse inner and dimmer outer coma and no nucleus. Well, I think we're doing a little better than that. This looks a little better to me than a than a comet. So I think this is where our 11 inches is helping us out. We can see the core and we can also see a little bit of structure. Certainly not what you would see in a nine and a quarter edge like Ray's got. But even with a two degree wide field zoomed in, we could see the inner core brighter than the spiral structure. We could make out brighter arms on the top side, which faded quickly in the outer regions. Um, now let's go look at Hubble. This is 3294 NGC 3294. Oh yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? Wow. 
So see, there's that brighter, there's that brighter region we were seeing. Look how it fades quickly in these outer regions. And then look here at these outer arms that just look like whirligig arms that are thrown out there. This is a beautiful galaxy. 3294, there's that brighter section. We would have to hover on this a long time to see much of it, but even what we're seeing is beautiful, isn't it, guys? 3294 is located at a distance of 98 million light years. 98 million light years away and receding at 1,586 kilometers per second. Well, now aren't you guys glad you saw it tonight at that pace? This could be the last night as visible. This is a spiral galaxy with no central bar. That means uh, they'd have a hard time getting alcoholic beverages, huh, Stu? An incomplete inner ring structure. Hola, Renato. Gracias por venir. Moderately wound spiral arms. Mount Lemon Cheetah. They have a slightly higher budget than most of us. <laughs> That's right. Widgy Digi. What does that mean, Andy? I'll tell you what. You can sure see that it's not a star, can't you? It always amazes me that these objects are up there um, 3294. Not even an image of it in Stellarium. We'll have to paste this in. You know, I did that in Starry Night Pro in several places. Here's Leo Minor. And we're used to seeing Leo, which actually looks like a lion. Leo Minor looks like very, very nothing to me. Okay, we gotta shove on, guys. If we're gonna get through uh, very many of these. So we're gonna go back to our sequence. We're using a sequence, and we put the, the starter loaf for you in the description in case you wanna uh, kind of experiment with what we're using you can use those commands to create your own sequence in SharpCap. Let's go to 3245 next. 3245. Uh, using that uh, description, you can plot out your own sequence and high tune it to just fine tune it to whatever you're using. For instance, we use 20 second exposures here, but you might need or want a different length of exposure. We use 100 gain, you might want a different gain. So you can fine tune it to what you want, but the starter loaf is there for you to use in the description. We also have a website, emeraldhillskies.com, and it would be great if you want to stop by there someday. It would be fun to have you stop by. 3535 in the fourth quarter. How about that? Um, okay, so we're gonna, here are tweets and updates about the game. What a turnaround. Turns out that letting, letting Patrick Mahomes on the field for any length of time at all is a bad idea. The Chiefs have come roaring back in the second half. And looks like, um, when this tweet was done, it was 35-35, like you say, Mike. Renato, eh, la apertura es eh, 11 pulgares. ¿Cómo se dice inches? 11, no me acuerdo, la palabra for inches. 11 inches. <laughs> Mm. 
pulgada, pulgadas, that's it. Pul pulgadas. Let's try this again. Pulgadas, I have to remember that word. Pulgadas, pulgadas. Boy, it's a tiny galaxy, guys. Look at that, so tiny. Gracias a ti, Renato. I do, Stu. You know, if you don't use it, you lose it. So I try to practice it every last bit. The last time I lived in a Spanish-speaking place, it was 1983. Entonces, tengo que practicar, porque si no, voy a perder todo. It's all going to be gone. NGC 3245, this is. NGC 3245, a galaxy. This is another one in Leo Minor. And the description for 3245 is on 114. Saves all that thumbing and back. It's a small, though somewhat bright spiral it may be a challenge to see from suburban locations. Be prepared to star hop to the field and use moderate mag uh, magnification and averted vision. It's a moderate obvious with averted vision as a round two arc minute wide glow like a small comet. Yeah, this does look like a small comet. It's a two arc minute long ellipse oriented north to south with a circular glow that brightens to a star like nucleus. Yep. That's pretty much the size of it, guys. I don't know if we zoom in. Boy, look at that. It does look like a star for nucleus. Look how big that core is. Let's darken the sky a little bit. Update, update your title in Spanish, por favor. Una galaxia, como se dice galaxy? Renato, como se dice ga galaxy? Galaxia? En Leo Menore, or something like that. Leo Menor, Leo Menor. Como seria? Renato, por favor, nos ayuda, por favor. Um, so this is about it for 3245. <laughs> Stu, you've got a major cyclone coming your way, and you're egging me on to update titles in Spanish. How do you do this? How do you put up with this? Someday, Stu, we've got to meet each other. Hey, aren't you right there in the... Twaranga or whatever, where the the cyclone's gonna hit face on. Leo Menor. Y Galaxia? Como se dice Galaxia? Renato? Uh, uh, <laughs> Renato. <laughs> Donde vives, Renato? En Peru? No me acuerdo. You know, guys, I'm not sure we can coax much more out of this. Four minutes, though. That's very little. Let's try to just get as much as we can. That's all we're going to get. It's just a giant nucleus, though. Colombia. ¿Cuál ciudad? We could see two feet of rain. Oh my goodness. All we could see was the giant, and we do mean giant core. 
huge, uh, along with a glow around it, elliptical glow. Andy says you need an art. Close to Bogota. Ay. Bueno, Renato, gracias por estar aquí. My goodness, two feet of rain. Oh, that's horrible. You know, our focus just swung out. But then again, I'm at 160 degrees. But look at our focus. That's embarrassing. You know, the other night when we tried to focus, it did not go well. Let's try it again, though. Let's um, let's move the scope off of this galaxy a little bit. And brighten this up, maybe make that three seconds at, and just look at our star field here real quick. Okay, that's good enough. Now, we're gonna unhook the camera here in SharpCap. And then we're gonna go back to Nina. We also have to unhook in SharpCap Do we have to unhook the focuser since we unhook the camera? I think we might. Let's hook the camera back up real quick and disconnect. Oh, we don't have the focuser connected. Okay, we're fine. Um, so back in Nina. The only advantage I can think of when we have to refocus like this is that we do get to demo these automatic focuses. And it is kind of nice that folks have not seen an automatic focus uh, routine yet. It's kind of fun to see it work when it works. But the other night we had part-time autofocus routine in Nina. This is completely automatic. I, I don't have to do any of this. Wet is better than flattened, right? What uh, Nina does is it starts at the uh, place where you are and it takes two pictures and it looks at the half flux radius between the stars and the image. And, you know, depending on the way you have things set up, it could be one star, it could be 50 stars. But then it uh, moves about uh, 20 stops away from the camera and takes another couple pictures and compares the results. And then it moves another 20 stops and compares again and it keeps doing this until it gets so far out of whack that it has measured the stars expanding and it has plotted the fact that as those stars expanded and therefore got out of, fo out of focus they generated more light and so that's kind of the definition of being in focus is you make as pinpoint of the star as possible. Once uh, Nina determines that those big donut looking giant star forms are no longer helping us. Then it goes back to the middle place where it started and it goes the other direction. And with any luck, what happens is you get this nice, uh, what would you call it? A, a parabola, you know? You get a nice parabola, it's a hyperbolic curve. And so that's what we're going now, is we're going the other way. Now it's moving the camera closer. It's moving the mirror closer to the camera. Now these links that it's moving are literally the width of a hair. And that's why I don't try to do focus myself, because 
it is incredibly small how small the rasa what an increment that the rasa moves and Stu says I don't have enough pets to need an arc a dinghy is enough <laughs> uh, and Mike this is all automated uh, so if it doesn't find a parabola it keeps taking additional steps this is all automatic and what Nina is doing here for us is it is creating uh, sort of like a, a mathematical solution to the fact that the Rasa is impossible to focus by by visible sight. It's just too small of a movement to be able to detect. With math and with photometry, what we're really using here with Nina, we're using photometry, which is the measurement of the slightest difference of light between stars. And with photometry and math, we get a much more reliable autofocus than what we would ever get with uh, one of those uh, bottom off masks over the end of the scope, which I would have to walk out there and climb up on a ladder because the Rasa, the, the end of its, uh, the end of the telescope is probably 15 feet in the air. And so I would have to lower it and climb up on a ladder and put the bottom off mask on and then try to do this visibly. The bottom off mask, if you've seen, it generates a series of spikes and you're trying to align the spikes in the middle. I can't do it accurately enough. No matter how hard I try, guessing at when those spikes are aligned, it will simply not create a good enough uh, focus for me. So with, yeah, with the Newtonian, it's probably, it's probably easier with the Newtonian, but with the Rasa, each stop is the width, actually the width of your grandmother's hair. It's not even as wide as the width of a normal hair. So what it's done here is it's found the bottoming out of the autofocus, of the parabola. And now it's saying, this is, this is all I need to do to find your, your focus. And so it, it put us right here. So let's see how it did. Let's go back to our equipment and disconnect the focuser and then disconnect the camera. And we have to do these. Um, We have to do these, uh, we have to disconnect it because in the case of sharp cap, it, it doesn't let go of the camera once it's grabbed it. So now you see those stars are now pinpoints. This is the way it should have been. No more donuts. All right, let's go to the knitting needle galaxy. The Knitting Needle Galaxy is NGC 3432. NGC 3432. That's a beautiful star field now. Wow. Look at that. Pinpoints. Absolute pinpoints. NGC thirty-four thirty-two. NGC thirty-four thirty-two. A galaxy in uh, Leo Minor again. I got tired of autofocus, so I put a stepper motor on the end of the scope and rotate the bottom off mask in front, but temperature changes down here. I have to focus every half an hour or so. I guess that's what was happening here. Yeah, it dropped to 33. I've heard people say if it changes two degrees, it's enough to throw focus off. I think sometimes with the Rasa, stop and think, if it's your... If it's the width of your grandmother's hair in the nursing home, that's how fine and that's how small the 
movement of the mirror has to be. I think sometimes when you move the rasa, it actually is relaxing the mirror. So uh, sometimes you do have to focus in the middle of a run. There you can see without the flat, you can see a little vignetting there. But that's okay, we won't, uh, maybe we'll try the flat back on there after. Well now, oh my goodness. Now you can see that, that vignetting of all that. See that giant donut circle? I don't think it matters much in this image because we're looking at something in the middle of the donut, see? So it won't mess us up, but the flats take care of all that. They take away that vignetting uh, problem there. The, the rasa is also very hard to align. Boy, this is a cool galaxy, isn't it? And I think I have back focus down to about maybe 4% accuracy, but I think sometimes that big donut vignetting thing you saw there, that could be my 4% back focus still being out. I worked on it last fall until I got it fairly, fairly good, but once it warms up in the spring, I'll work on it again. Tube gets shorter as it cools, moving the focus plane. I'm sure you're right, Mike. So temperature affects focus on telescopes. How does that work? Yeah, Mike's explaining. Also, just really cold affects everything. The, the, uh, the material that's holding the mirror and everything is affected uh, by the cold. So it's definitely uh, feeling it out there, isn't it? I'm going to put this just, I'm going to hold the shift key down while I make this fine adjustment because if you do that in sharp cap, it's kind of the equivalent of putting the, the histogram in fine tuning mode. I'm going to pull it just barely to the right of that crest so the sky is darker. And then I'm going to zoom in some more and then try to pull up the mids a little more. What a cool looking galaxy. This is NGC 3432, which my handy dandy cheat sheet says is on 117. I think the tube with a Ross is made of a kind of uh, aluminum, if I remember right. A kind of, a kind of aluminum. Let's see, 3432. A barred spiral in Leo Minor. Very nice edge on galaxy, about three degrees southeast of 38 Leonis Minoris. Need to make a careful star hop to it. Take your time, be patient. Very nice and striking galaxy, even a small telescope. It, at 23, 23 power, it's a sharp five arc minute long glow. Oriented northeast to southwest with a bright core that tapers away from the center on either end. Especially when seen with a vertivision. 72, the galaxy is an elongated spindle with a prominent star punctuating the galaxy's southwestern tip. Yep, look at that. You can see that prominent star right there. Knitting Needle Galaxy. You can see why it's called that. The Knitting Needle Galaxy is a is indeed a spindle shaped beauty. We could see the star punctuating 
the um, arms on the, what was that, south, southwestern tip. What would be the best? What would be the best thing to make a telescope out of? I would say, Renato, the one that you can use, the telescope you can use, that's the best one. This galaxy is edge on. We could make out star forming regions in the arms. Because, you know, so many people, Renato, they uh, buy these telescopes and don't use them. I wonder if this star is probably a foreground star. I don't think that's a part of that galaxy. This is beautiful, though. It's uh, 3432. NGC 3432 wiki. NGC. Oops, I misspelled it. NGC 3432. Wow, this is a Hubble view. Oh my goodness, isn't that amazing? There's that star on the southwestern tip. And all of those bluish zones are places where stars are forming up. Karen, good to have you aboard. Where are you uh, logging on from? Six minutes, 40 seconds. So, if you have been watching the Super Bowl, it appears that Kansas City has pulled it off. To everyone's surprise. Now I think while I'm here, I'm gonna put a flat back on. Cause that bothersome. I wonder if I can interrupt this sequence. Stop. I'm gonna put a flat back on. Um Oh, you know what? It stopped the mount. I didn't know that it would stop the mount. Let's put... this one from November and try it again. Well, this is sad. But we were between objects anyway, so it's okay. Let's go back to the zero position. I use the emergency stop to stop the um, um, sequence. It's the first time I've ever done that. And it uh, parks the mount. It stops it from, uh, from uh, tracking the sky. So it turned off the tracking. Renato said, I would find it difficult to stop using your telescope if you had one. <laughs> Good for you, Renato. Oh my goodness, Karen, you're in Scotland. What time must it be there? Roughly 3.19 a.m.? And why are you getting up in the middle of the night? And are you Scottish? This is so cool. Okay, now we're going to try to start this tracking again. Okay, now let's start this sequence again. Okay, so the next object we're going to go to is... 3190, and that's the Leo Quartet, 3190, and I think we have picked out a star target, rather, that puts us in the middle of the Leo Quartet, so we'll be able to see four uh, objects 
in one field of view, the entire Leo Quartet in one field of view. Yeah, from now on, Mike, I'll know that the uh, emergency stop stops everything. Wow, Karen, why, why are you up in the middle of the night like this? 3 a.m. Do you like work as a nurse or something and you just got off work? Or did you set your alarm so you could get up in the middle of Emerald Hill Skies astronomy? <laughs> Either way, it's great to have you on board, Karen. Okay, so now the mount is um, plate solving so that it can put the objects right in the center. You are a nurse, Karen. Well, or you, or did you set the alarm? Which was it? Are you a nurse or you set the alarm? You just got off night shift, maybe. 3190. Ah, yes, you're Scottish. And yes, you can't sleep. <laughs> Laugh out loud. Well, we're sorry about that, but we're glad tonight that you came here to be with us in the middle of this insomnia. Mike had the power cord come out of his USB powered hub, caused all kinds of grimaces. I bet. Stu, I'd set my alarm to watch you at 3.20 a.m. Stu, you are so kind. We've got to like meet in Singapore someday or something. Bailey 11, good to have you on board from Florida. Wow, that flat did not work very well. Okay, so there, oh, I guess it's not bad. It's not good either, with the mids turned up that loud. Let's bring these blacks over just a little bit more so that sky turns dark. And then let's start exploring where are these Leo triplets. Now we can do a, um, Plate solve only, and that will make sure that we're aligned perfectly with this part of the sky. And yes, Karen, we are so glad to have you. But boy, I hope you can go back to sleep. Scope cam, thank you. Ray, you're my savior here. Okay, so what we did is we uh, will now use uh, deep sky image annotation to find our, our Leo quartet. Okay, so this is NGC 3190 and 3189, which are evidently so close. This is NGC 3187. This is NGC 3185. And this is NGC 3193. Now let's just go over for a second and what we'll do is we'll say here show chart and then we'll look where the Leo Quartet is. It's right in the middle of the mane of the lion and we're looking off to the east. By the way, this is the observatory down here at the bottom. That's the open door. You can walk out the open door and go down that sidewalk, takes you into this building, and right there is where I'm sitting. So this photorealistic horizon shows you the building where I'm sitting. So off our east horizon, here's the Leo Quartet. Now what I wonder is, what's the difference in 3189 and 3190? 3189 and 3190. What's the difference? What does Sharp Cap do if we look for NGC 3189? Where does it go? <laughs> right there. So that's 3189. Thir yeah, it must be a galaxy within the galaxy maybe a galaxy in the foreground. This is a cool um, galaxy, isn't it? This one up here, 3187. Look at that, it's got like 
open pinwheels. This is just a diffuse glow. And that's a spiral that's kind of face on. Okay, so this must be the pinwheel deal. This must be the two galaxies together. That's the diffuse glow and that's the galaxy that's face on. Okay, let's get rid of our deep sky image adaptation now and look. Maybe we see something back here in the back. I wonder if that's one of those dust lanes. And in this case, when they were naming NGC objects, they named this with a separate name. Yeah, look at that. Now look, you're starting to see a little bit of spiral structure here. That's just after 4 minutes and 40 seconds. And this is a real-time view of the sky. This is, uh, this is not the planetarium software. But you're starting to see that spiral structure there. I've got the camera zoomed in at 200%. So this is what you might call at Best Buy, if you bought one of those cameras, this would be your digital zoom, which isn't worth that much. But with the ASI 2600MC Pro, you do get a little more for your money out of the digital zoom, I think. So you're really starting to see some of that spiral structure here in 3185. Right here is 3185. So this is 3180, no, 3190, we're assuming. The big one, I bet, is 3190. And the, the little bit behind that dark lane was probably 3189. And we're just starting now at six minutes to see a little bit of 3187's uh, whirly gig. See? It's starting to look like an S, isn't it? Wow, this is almost looking like a steering wheel up here. Look how you can see a figure eight, like the infinity symbol. And then this still looks like a blob. I think this elliptical is always going to look like an elliptical blob. Or whatever you want to call it. It's a blob galaxy. All right, let's see what uh, Stephen James O'Meara says about this. 3190. 3190 on page 87. Thirty-one nine is a small and dim spiral galaxy midway between third magnitude stars Gamma Zeta Leonis. It's paired with our next Herschel object, thirty-one ninety-three, which is the blob, uh, and is the brightest of four NGC objects in the immediate area. Thirty-one ninety was not readily visible in his four inch at twenty-three power, but he could see it at seventy-two power. It's a two arc minute long ellipse oriented northwest to southeast, slightly brighter center. With averted vision, the galaxy's disk is not uniformly lit but appears disturbed. Larger telescopes will show the disturbance is caused by a warped dust lane that mars one side of the galaxy's disk. 3193, which is the blob, it's a small and dim elliptical galaxy very tiny, circular glow, no defining characteristics. It's 1.5 arc minutes south of an 8.5 magnitude star. Yeah. How about that? 
so 3190 after just four minutes we could see a dark dust lane obscuring the back arms of this spiral nearly edge on structure. Beautiful core. Looked like something out of a what? A movie? Um, it looks like we could travel there. How far away would this be, Stu? Maybe 95 million light years from our solar system. Okay, maybe it will take us a while to travel there. 13 groups of galaxies like this in the LEO2 group, plus dozens of other galaxies. Stu. Thanks, Stu. Wow. 110 galactic clusters. Pack a big lunch if you're going to travel there. Yes. Renato, C. M L Y A million light years. Each of them with a billions of stars, Stu points out each with billions stars. At this point, gang, I think it's probably a good idea that we pause and just appreciate everything in the universe. These four objects that are so far away And that light has been traveling 95 million years to get here. 95 million years. And tonight, we stopped it. And yes, do I'm going into my soliloquy about feeling guilty that we stopped this light after it made this long journey and we stole it from its journey. But then somebody pointed out to me, you nitwit, if it hadn't hit your telescope, it would hit the dirt. <laughs> I guess that's true, but it still feels bad that we stole these photons from someone else being able to see them and we hog them. I'm going to do a screenshot of this because it's so amazing. I'm going to call the screenshot the Leo Quartet 12 minutes, 37 subframes. Put that in the same place where SharpCap saves its pictures and save one from SharpCap. But honestly, think about this. How far this light traveled. Apparently 95 million years. If indeed the apparent age is the real age. God didn't create things that look like they were 45 million years old, then this really has been traveling 95 million years. Look at this S-shaped little, <laughs> this little whirly gig back here. It's so cool, isn't it? Wow. Well, let's push on, guys, but what a great sight, right? 
Those photons were created by the architect to be appreciated by his children. That's right. You're saving that life from having made the incredible journey in vain. Good point, Stu. That's the way we should look at it. Okay, we're going to run... to 33.95 was that something we just was 33.95 part of that group no it wasn't okay so let's slew there 33.95 again is in Leo no it's in yeah Leo minor instead of Leo Thirty-three ninety-five. It's a very dark night. I had to dial up the uh, night vision <clears throat> way high on the scope cam. I mean, I mean, I had to dial it as high as you could possibly dial it because it was so dark out there. This particular night vision scope, or camera, this particular night vision camera doesn't emit an infrared uh, beacon. It's just the camera. So that's how dark it was. Super pitch black dark. Only the light dome of Louisville there along the, uh, the woods and not much in this direction. NGC This is interesting, isn't it? It looks like the two galaxies are interacting like they're doing a tango. Bum, 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 bum. Ba da 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 there you can see the spiral arms after just 80 seconds. And over here is something else that it's interacting with. NGC 3395. Nothing. Stellarium doesn't have a picture. It's that nondescript. 3395 is on 116. That's zoomed in at 150%. So way beyond the optical capabilities and into the digital imaginary stuff. 3395 is a small and dim galaxy less than one degree from 46 Leonis Minoris. It's interacting with NGC 3396, which is not on the Herschel 400 list. In small telescopes at low power, the two galaxies appear as a single object. The surrounding field has several other galaxies too, so be careful in your search. Fun. Be prepared to use moderate magnification to see your target well. And four inch, 
Uh, they blend to become a very low surface brightness glow, about two arc minutes in diameter, oriented east to west. At 72 power, 3995 and 3996 are visible as two slightly over one arc minute wide glows touching. NGC 3395 is the westernmost of the two glows. I think this must be 3395. Let's see. Yeah. So 3395 is this one, and 3396 is that one. And up here is IC2604. We could make out NGC3395 as a brighter Whirligig style galaxy above and to the right slightly of NGC 3396 interacting in a deathly, well, however you say it, however you want to say that, in a spiral arm warping tango. IC2604 was higher to the right in our view. It's amazing, huh? At um, 4 minutes and 40 seconds. can see a sharp turn there, a sharp turn of that arm. And then we can start to see these arms spiraling out as the galaxy turns. Sounds like a soap opera, as the galaxy turns. This one is just basically a needle to us. Wikipedia doesn't have it either. That's wild. Not very often you see that, huh, Stu? All right. Well, we have 15 minutes left. I'm curious, over to the west, let's head off to Uranus real quick since we saw tonight that Herschel discovered Uranus too. It seems like it should only be fair that we There we see what uh, Herschel discovered. Uranus, would that be now the next to last planet, right? Uranus and then Neptune, correct? So it's next to farthest away in our solar system, correct? And the seventh I watched that video that you guys recommended the other night. Excuse me. Done by a guy named, what was his name? Carl's Lab or something you told me about? I watched it. And uh, it was good. And it said you had to drive several miles away from this little green pea sized sun the guy had to get in his car and drive for miles away to come to the next star but the uh, 
what was it, the solar system, if the sun was a green pea, the solar system was like, what, 100 yards away, I think? The out, outward reaches, in other words, Uranus. Hundred twenty seven miles, Ray says. Cody's lab, that's it, Stu. Thank you. I found another one that I liked a lot. It was Rats. I hope I saved it. Ah, it was. If you look up an image of the Earth and Moon, you're going to get a picture where they're quite close together. It's going like that. But in reality, the Earth and the Moon are about, about that far apart. That is the Earth and the Moon to scale. Taking the same concept of the solar system. Let's see, how can I share this with you guys? Um, guess I can go here. And paste it there. I like that guy's too. He drove out to a desert and he did it. Um, he made a solar system model in a desert and he spent a lot of money, you could tell, with these little glowing lights. He spent a lot of time. And I liked it that the lights glowed in the dark and then he drove around the orbits and did time exposures of the driving. <laughs> I thought it was really cool. Showing the orbits, kind of. Okay, so here we've got Uranus, right here in the middle. And those would be some of Uranus's moons. And what we can do is we can look, we're seeing a moon here on the right, and then outward and then inner, and then a moon on the left. So what we can do here is zoom in and it'll identify these zooms for us, the, these moons for us. I'm gonna guess that, let's see if we can see two on each side. Oh yeah, there's another one right there that was so tight that we almost didn't notice it. See it real tight right there? Okay, so these are farther out make sure we're oriented. Yeah, so it's Oberon, Umbriel, Ariel, and Titania. Oberon, somebody write that down. Oberon, Umbriel. So this is Oberon, Umbriel, Ariel, and Titania. So tonight you can say, I not only saw Uranus, I saw Uranus's moons. Now that's a star, and that's a star. Those are all stars, so they might be masquerading, but they're not really moons. Those are all stars. Yeah, so, oh, that's I, I held down my, there we go. So you see, um, these other moons are so much closer. And that's why, in part, now we might make out Miranda if we look closely. Boy, Miranda would be just a little bit of lint on the bottom here, somewhere here. 
Looks like there's a spike up there, doesn't it? See that spike on top? That could be Juliet. And on the bottom is Miranda. So this little spike is showing up because it's Juliet. But that's a star. And these are all stars. But the moon system is right here. Isn't that fun? Okay, so I'm going to capture a little tiny <laughs> picture of this Uranus with Umbriel. No. Yeah. No. Oberon. Oberon, <clears throat> Umbrio, Ariel, Titania. And that's at five minutes, 16 subframes on 2023. 0 to 12. You see why you need um, something like Stellarium, in other words, a planetarium software, because otherwise you'd just be guessing which one of these are moons, which ones are not. Okay, those four are probably moons. Is that it? You know, and you wouldn't know which name was which. It's pretty fun, isn't it? Phoebe, good to have you here. We're looking at Uranus. Sir William Herschel first observed Uranus on 13 March 1781, leading to its discovery as a planet expanding the known boundaries of the solar system, making Uranus the first planet classified as such with the aid of a telescope. How about that? Very cool. Okay, that was a little detour, but not a detour. It's not on the Herschel 400 list, but it was discovered at least by Herschel, and that's fun. Okay, back to our list though. Uh, let's go quickly to NGC 3227. And that'll be our last object of the night. And NGC 3227 is another instance of being able to see two for one, a two for one special. Because you've got NGC 3227 side by side with 3226. Stu says, Uranus had been observed on many occasions before its recognition as a planet, but is generally mistaken for a star. Possibly the earliest known observation was by Hipparchus in 128 BC. That's amazing. This is um, NGC 3227-3226. And 3227, 3226. These are galaxies in Leo. Galaxies in Leo. You guys have been wonderful to come along. Mike's going to fire up his live stream. Thank you, Mike, for being here. Good luck. You guys have been great for being here tonight. Uh, do please click subscribe. If you haven't already subscribed and you like this kind of content, it really helps to click the thumbs up, too. If you like this kind of content and you think it's been okay, please go ahead and click thumbs up, and that way we can raise this channel in other people's um, 
field of view in their searches, you see. Strange. So glad you guys aren't seeing this. This must just be, again, Here we go. That's better. Um, so let's do a quick um, plate solve only so that we can tell which is which here. Thank you, Phoebe. What's the chat? Oh, I think he meant uh, Mike's channel, Phoebe. Yeah, I'm glad you guys weren't on camera view because it took me a minute to get this one set up. That would have been super ugly. You would have been saying, Doug, what in the world is wrong? <laughs> okay, so let's do now our... So 27 is on the right and 26 is on the left. Companion Galaxies in Leo. 3226, page 87. 3227 is a moderately bright, let's see, 27 is on the right. Moderately bright and elongated spiral galaxy. And it's tightly paired and interacting with 3226, a Seifert galaxy. Uh, 27's core is easy to see at moderate magnifications. See, that's what we're looking at now, is just the core. It's basically simply an elongated haze. No discernible details. Um, basically, when you bump up the power, you might see the galaxies kissing, he says. Uh, the more southerly of the two appears as an amorphous elliptical glow with a star-like nucleus in a circular lens of light. So let's see if we can get some more structure here. Okay, at just four minutes, we're starting to see the spiral structure, but that one's always just going to be a haze. NGC 3227 showed the beginnings of a spiral structure at four minutes. NGC 3226, the companion with which 3227 is kissing Omira. Omira is the author of this book on the Herschel 400 list. Um, was just a simple blob. And elliptical. That's 3226 and 3227. Let's say the same thing. Okay, now I'm going to take um, the um, uh, 
I'm going to take the observed. I'm going to say ignore. So out of 402 objects, we only have 93 left that are unobserved. I think that's true. Let's see. Ignore that and then show not observed. Yeah. Well, let me run this first. 103. 103 of 402 objects that have not been observed yet. So we're getting very close to 75% uh, done with the Herschel 400, and some of you guys have been here the whole time. So thank you so much as we take one last view of that spiral structure starting to come in at just six minutes of integration. There, you see a little more of the spiral structure at just six minutes. As we take one last view, I uh, want to thank you guys for being here tonight. And uh, let's be in prayer specifically for Stu as he how long will it be before this cyclone hits you? About an hour and a half or so, or one hour, Stu? How long will it be? Renato, gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. Es un privilegio tener, tenerte de Colombia. Muy lejos de aquí. Thank you for being here, Renato. Uh, thank you, Phoebe. Thank you to all you guys that came here instead of the... Uh, Super Bowl, or maybe you watched the Super Bowl along with it, like I think Mike was doing. <laughs> and we'll see you the next time, the next clear night. I hope you'll stop back by again. Uh, uh, don't forget to hit a thumbs up if you can. And if you're watching this as recording, thank you for watching it all the way to the end. That's amazing. Please do consider subscribing and clicking thumbs up. Check out that merchandise at Spread Shop. You can see those links in the store. And God bless and have a great evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Ken, for being with us. Good night. God bless all of you. We look forward to seeing you next time. Take care. Goodbye.